All right, let's do stuff. Let's do 312 stuff. Oh, there's like half of you out there. How are there, how there's there uh, about half attendance, but like 80% of the class have missed the lecture questions? Hmm, I wonder. Uh, so today we're talking about reports. Uh, and we want to go through how the reports work for this class. So let's do exactly that. Uh, I, I told my 116 lectures this today. I don't know. We're, we're at the, I'll tell you all this too. We're at that point of the semester where, I don't know about y'all, but I'm feeling it. I'm exhausted. Uh, and uh, we're at the, we're at this, this point. Where are we even? Nine. We're nine weeks in. Uh, so we've all been beat up pretty hard. We're, we're exhausted and stuff. But we're not close enough to the end where we can start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, I'm feeling it. I'm sure most, if not all of you, are feeling it too. Uh, and today's pretty open-ended. We'll talk about reports. So I'll, I'll make sure we get some of that. But I'm very open to getting sidetracked today. And, uh, uh, and I don't even have Wi-Fi just to add to all the frustration and everything. There we go. Now I have Wi-Fi. Uh, so I'm open to getting sidetracked today. Uh, and it's an open-ended lecture with any open-ended lecture where I'm going into code and just doing, uh, doing whatever. Uh, very uh, uh, open to suggestions if there's something you want to see, especially if it's something that will help you in the course, something you're struggling with the, on the homework assignments, I can go ad lib a demo. Uh, I'm always free to do that, but especially today, especially this point in the semester, uh, if we get decently sidetracked, I'd be all right with that. But there are, that said, there are some things that I definitely want to talk about. But I could probably get it all done in, if I had to, like 10 minutes or so. But uh, I want to give, if uh, by default, what am I trying to say here? By default, I'll give longer explanations and a lot of discussion about the reports. But if we get sidetracked, I ain't going to feel too um, obligated to get through it all in great level of, of detail. Okay, so any, anything, um, is it, maybe it's not 80%. It's, I think it was like 75 on the last lecture question. I keep forgetting enrollment's 120. I keep thinking it's 100. So maybe, actually, it's probably about right uh, that not too many people are uh, doing the lecture questions from home. And the number of students who get it wrong probably matches, like, they're just guessing and taking their 20% shot. Uh, maybe I jumped the gun on that one. But uh, any questions or anything? Because if not, I'm just going to go on my... I'll probably just space out and just do my, do my regular, this is what reports are spiel. Or we could just take a nap. Where do you submit your reports? So, good question. Where do you submit your reports? Uh, so, your reports are going, I don't remember which one of these that would be in, probably project requirements, uh, but reports, Except type erasure. Uh, reports go in your repo in a directory called reports. I think it's in project requirements. Uh, so I got I to gotta make sure I'm consistent with my documentation is the reason I want to pull it up. Uh, yeah, create a directory named reports inside your, your repository. And about half the teams each semester seem to mess this one up. And by the report um, checkpoint, is that what we're calling it this semester? Which is coming up, isn't it? Not much left in this semester. It's got to be coming up. Next, next Friday is the team report checkpoint. By the checkpoint, like half of the teams, part of the feedback is, dude, your reports have to be like in this directory. Uh, but once you push your reports into your repo in that directory, uh, we have all your repo links already. So there's no actual submission for the reports or for your um, end of the semester project deadline. There's no like, here is my final submission. It's just whatever's in your repo at that point in time. Uh, so at the project report checkpoint, uh, the TAs, uh, each TA is going to have a handful of projects to look at. Uh, they're going to clone your repo. Go into your repo, look for that reports directory, which will be at the top level. Like they should be able to go to your repo, and right there, stare them in the face, should be a directory named reports. And they'll open that up, and that's where they'll find all your reports. So, whatever's in that directory at this checkpoint, 
In this checkpoint, we're pretty loose on the deadline. It's whenever the TAs get to it, whatever's in there at that point, that's when, uh, what they're going to look at. Uh, and whatever's there, they'll give you feedback on that and tell you, uh, okay, we're looking for this and you did this, do this to fix it, et cetera. Uh, that's what the report checkpoint is going to be. Uh, that's a little different than the project deadline. The actual deadline, it's what you have in your repo at that point in time. Uh, you can't work on your project after the TAs. They look at the timestamps. They see if any commits were made after the deadline, and they'll ignore those commits. They'll clone your repo at the latest commit that's before the deadline, and then that's what they'll grade. Uh, which does come up, it is relevant, because a lot of teams do work on their project after the deadline, because some teams still have the presentation after the deadline, and they want to like polish things up and you know, make things look a little better for the presentation. Uh, even though they can't get points for it, uh, they'll still work on it after for their presentation. Uh, since we're talking about project, and since I'm here right now in the schedule, uh, a few reminders about this. The presentation, you're not graded on the functionality of your project. Uh, I mean, it has to work. <laughs> I'll explain. That sounded weird. You're not graded on functionality, but it has to work. Uh, the project like has to work. Like You have to be able to go to the site. For your project, it's all about the deployment. So we have to be able to go to your URL and actually use your app. Um, at all, like it has to be there, exist, be deployed with HTTPS and work. Uh, but it doesn't have to have all the features implemented properly for your presentation. Uh, that's what we're checking for the project deadline when we go in and grade your projects. That's when we're grading all the functionality. Are all the features there? Does it do what it's supposed to do and everything? Uh, we're not testing that part of it for the project. And the main reason for that is anybody presenting on May 8th is going to have a severe disadvantage versus those presenting on May 19th. Uh, so May 8th, that's a week, almost a full week before the actual project deadline. I don't expect you to have all the features done. Uh, so you're there just to present your deployment. You do have less time to do your deployment itself, um, but deployment shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, we deployed in... in uh, uh, I mean, it was across two lectures, but it took less than 50 minutes in class to do a deployment. Uh, granted, it'll take you longer because it's your first time doing it, but uh, it shouldn't take too long to do your deployment. Uh, so you will have less time to do that, but you won't have less time to finish your project itself. You won't have less time to finish your reports as well um, for the project. So I try to make that as fair as possible, but we do have to have presentations on different dates just because that's how time works. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah, so the, the uh, deployment is strictly the presentation, and the presentation is strictly deployment. If you are familiar, if you've talked to anyone or whatever you know about any CC312 in the past, the, this is very different. This is a big change, um, the way the, the project grading works. Presentation is only deployment, and deployment is only, it's a one-to-one -one relationship, deployment and presentation. And then the features, the actual functionality of your app, that's one-to-one -one with, uh, and the reports, is one-to-one -one with the actual, what the TAs are grading here. Uh, now that said, some of the TAs will go to your deployment to, you know, just speed up the grading process. If you're deployed, they'll go there, but if you're not deployed, it's not going to affect your grade. They'll run it with Docker, just like it were a homework assignment, and grade it that way. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's in between. Yeah. Uh, so the presentation, you get 0, 1, 2, or 3 AOs. Uh, and let's talk about it. Today, I mean, today's kind of a report day, but really a general project day. So let's just talk about the project all day. That's what y'all want to... Uh, is it possible to... That's what y'all want to talk about. I'll talk about whatever y'all want to talk about. Is it possible to authenticate live chat messages? Yeah. Oh, yeah, baby. Uh, homework 4, you'll do exactly that as well. Uh, is there, I think, I, I think that's a deeper question. Uh, I'll circle back to it in a second. Is there no class May 17th and May 15th? No, no. There's no class those dates. Bless you. This is final exam week. 
so we, have a, we don't have a final exam, but we have a final exam time slot allocated for the course, and we use that for uh, presentations. But this is, uh, this is the final exam week. Oh, it was already answered in chat. Uh, so the presentation, so you get one application objective if your app is deployed at all. So if you went through the process of deploying your app, you got uh, it set up Nginx, you got a domain name, uh, you got a certificate, you got HTTPS set up, and you get down here for your demo, and you go to your URL, and you go superawesomesite.com, enter, and your site pops up. Boom, there it is. That's an AO. So going through the process of deploying, that's an AO. If you're able to use that app, if you say, okay, I click here, I click here, everything works, and it's not completely broken, uh, and you at least mention your incomplete features, so this is where it comes into play. You don't have to have all the features implemented, but your app has to work. Whatever you do have implemented should be in working order. Your app can't, like when you click on one link or you send one message or you start a game or you start a draft, your app can't just completely blow up and uh, get uh, 500 errors after that. Uh, if it doesn't completely blow up, that's two AOs. And then uh, at some point in your presentation, I kind of recommend hiding your domain name, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, hide your domain name during your presentation, so be real sly when you type it into the address bar. Or already have it open in a full screen window or something uh, when you're demoing it. Uh, and then after you're demoing, then, really big on the screen, say, here's our domain name, and then go for the load test. That's when all of us in the audience are going to go to your URL, go to your site, and start clicking things, start breaking things. People are going to submit HTML into your text forms and everything, and uh, we're going to... I know y'all. You're going to try to break it. If you don't, I will. If uh, none of us do, the TAs will. Uh, we're going to load test it to make sure your app handles the load, and there's going to be all the attacks coming in uh, to make sure that your app survives actual users. Can your app actually survive the users? This is the, uh, the load test, but also the robustness test that I, oh yeah, I'm making sure I use the word robust there. Your app must be robust, so it can't be hard coded to work specifically on super sanitized inputs. Uh, it has to be able to work under this load. Uh, if that survives, if the app survives that load test, which is pretty informal, just a bunch of us uh, going to your site and using it, creating accounts and all that, uh, if it survives, that's three AOs. Uh, so you definitely can get partial. Uh, so one AO, I don't want anybody to go through the process of deploying, getting the domain name, getting a, a DigitalOcean droplet, if that's the route you're going, doing your GitHub education pack. I don't want anybody going through all of that and walking away with nothing. So if you do all that, you're getting an AO. And if you're doing all that, the demo's probably gonna work. I think if you do deploy, and this is the intent, um, this is like the design behind this grading. If you go through all that, I want you to get two AOs for doing the deployment. And then the load test is the actual challenge. Can your app survive uh, to get that third AO? Uh, they've a lot of, uh, a lot of presentations in the past, they're like, here's our app, and then even when the team is demoing, sometimes it'll break and have errors and everything, and it's like, y'all supposedly spent all semester on this, and you built something that's completely buggy and broken. Um, so the load test is there to encourage you to actually build good, good software. All <laughs> uh, right. We try to load test ourselves. Do we just open a bunch of tabs? Yeah, I mean, there's four to six of you as well. Uh, so you can at least load test with four to six of you. But yeah, opening a bunch of tabs. If four to six of you each open like five tabs, you have a pretty good load test. And try to break things. Like, as developers, we tend to be more delicate with our apps, and I'm guilty of this too. We tend to be more delicate of our apps than actual end users will be. Uh, when somebody in the class goes to your URL and is just like, oh, let's check this thing out, 
they're, gonna, they're not going to handle that app with grace. Where when you're testing, you're, you're usually like very careful and tiptoeing around everything. Um, actual users don't do that. They, they break stuff. Uh, I know because I, I, like just in the last lecture I mentioned it, when you saw the UB rating songs domain name in Monday's lecture, and a bunch of you just put a bunch of HTML injection attacks and some garbage. And one of them was my TA. It wasn't even any of y'all. But the worst offender was one of my TAs who sent all kinds of, like, five different attacks he launched at the site. I mean, the site lived. But then 116 students have all this garbage data in their, uh, in their song ratings file. So I had to go in the database and delete some things and uh, just to make it less annoying for 116 students. Uh, but that's what users might do during your presentation. Not that I encourage that. Not that we should be trying to break things, but at least uh, making sure HTML is sanitized. That's one thing that you should expect to happen during the load test, which you should be making sure anyway, because that's a you know, that's a might result in a zero for the whole grading of the project, too. If you have an HTML injection attack vulnerability in your app, it might just be, maybe you'll get points for your presentation for your deployment, because I am treating those as separate things this semester. But when the TAs go to actually grade your site, they find an HTML injection attack. It might just be a zero for the whole project uh, portion. So that's something you should be watching for anyway. Uh, and the reason that's so harsh is because it should be. It's in the real world, if you have a beautiful, wonderful app, that has this obvious security vulnerability, and you might as well not, you would have been better off not building anything. You're not doing your company, or your boss as a service by building that insecure app. You just did more damage than you've delivered value at that point. Um, consequences should be less than zero for this. You should get negative points for security to reflect that. But I'm not going below zero with those. Okay. Has a percent of apps broken on the load test before in the past? Zero percent. Uh, this is the first semester I'm doing the load test. So I, I revamped the presentation. Presentation in the past was uh, a bit different. There were three sections of it. You had to demo your app. You had to explain the architecture of your app. And then you had to go over reflections, what you would tell your past self if you could talk to, go back in the past and talk to your team at the beginning of the semester. What would you say to them? Uh, so the presentation has been completely revamped to be the load test, which... Um, I think will be more, <laughs> among a lot of other things, I think it's better for your education and all that stuff. Uh, but I think it'll be more fun, too, uh, when we're watching the presentations. Uh, what can impact how the app responds to the load tests? Uh, so the, I guess the big one is if you're not handling concurrency properly. Because uh, you're going to have web sockets in your app, and if you can't handle like 20 or so, because not everybody's going to do it. I don't have my hopes up, and a lot of students don't show up to all the presentations. You know, it just is what it is. I've come to accept that. Uh, so maybe at most like 20 people are going to be using your app. Uh, so can you handle 20 simultaneous web socket connections? Uh, now, for your project, this shouldn't be too bad because you're using libraries. For your homework, this would be a lot tougher. Uh, a lot of, of y'all have some not very robust homework code that breaks. Even if you, you touch it just wrong, it'll fall apart. Uh, but for your project code, this shouldn't be too hard. But we're making sure that you have some level of concurrency implemented in your web server. Because demoing with just one user, you might be completely single-threaded and have that look like it works well. Uh, but once 20 people access and only one person can use things at a time. Uh, so that would be a big one. Uh, the, uh, if things like legit crash, uh, some servers just on some input, somebody will crash the server, and then it goes down for everybody else. Uh, so maybe in debugging and testing, you notice that every once in a while, the app just crashes, and you don't quite know why. But whatever, you just Docker compose up again and just start testing it again. Uh, those things are going to be exposed during the load test. Uh, you're going to be demoing, and it just goes down because somebody hit one of those errors that you ignored, and then 
the whole demo goes down, uh, things like that. Uh, just making sure that you don't have, I'd say those are the two big ones actually, concurrency and making sure you don't have those bugs that crashes your server every once in a while. No. Mm -mm. Four dollars will be fine. Uh, so the question: do you, do you recommend getting a bigger server to handle the load uh, for the load test than like the four dollar option on DigitalOcean? No, 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 no. The four dollar option on DigitalOcean should be able able to handle plenty. Should be able to handle way more than than what we have here. Like you can all go to cc312.com at the same time. I'm pretty sure that's a four dollar server. Like it's. It, and it's humming along just fine. Uh, the uh, Towers game that uh, I briefly showed last time, which is pretty intensive, like it's doing quite a bit of stuff and there's gra uh, it doesn't render graphics, that's client side, but uh, there's quite a bit going on with that one. And yeah, that runs just fine. Um, if, you, if that is an issue, that's something with your code. Your code is way too inefficient at that point. It's uh, like the four dollar server isn't like it's not that beefy, but I mean computers are so fast these days that even the four dollar server is still an incredible amount of computing power. Uh, I think it's only ten gigs of storage, uh, so uh, make sure you're not too storage intensive. And it's I think half a gig of RAM, so potentially the RAM you could hit, but even that's still quite a bit for what we're doing anyway. What's the penalty when 27017 is open and the passwords are stored as text? Um, wait, those are two different things though. Is open and the passwords are stored as text. If you're storing user passwords in plain text, like that's, like you're done after that. Um, we have like a whole week where we talk about handling user passwords and everything uh, next week, actually. Uh, so that's bad. If you have 27017 open, it is, yeah, I was circling back around. Uh, if 27017 is open and you can access the passwords, as long as the passwords you can access are hashed and salted, that's fine. Uh, 27017 being open is a security vulnerability, but I already came clean that I made that mistake myself. I can't expect all of you to not make that mistake. Uh, and I only mentioned it one time. Uh, that one I'm gonna have to overlook uh, in the spirit of fairness. Uh, so, but even if 27017 is open, those passwords should be hashed on the server. Well, we haven't talked about hashing passwords, but next week we'll talk about hashing passwords. Hash your passwords before you store them, and then you'll be fine. Never ever I'll say this next week a bunch of times, but never, ever, ever store passwords in plain text. Don't do it. Do not store passwords in plain text. Okay. 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 Where are we at? Pre no, presentation. Team meeting form. Y'all been filling out your team meeting forms? Uh, why am I so blind? Okay. So open source reports. So you have three reports that you have to do. Just to make sure, I, I know I can do this off memory, but just to make sure, let's go to the documentation. So you have three reports to write how your TCP connection is established. Somewhere in your code, you have to have code that looks like your homework code. Right? And this is the, the whole point of your reports, is your homework code, like that wasn't just made up stuff. It wasn't just something we did for, for fun. Well, we kind of did. But uh, that's like real stuff. Like that's how you write a web server. That's how you write a web framework, which means when you're allowed to use libraries on your project, that is what those libraries do. Somewhere in that library that you imported, that you just said import Flask, Flask that do everything for me, somewhere inside the code for Flask that you just downloaded by saying pip install this thing, is code that looks like your homework code. Because that stuff has to get done. Headers have to be parsed. TCP has to be used. You ha a TCP server has to be spun up. That WebSocket handshake has to happen. All of that stuff is in the libraries that you import. And the libraries just do it all for you. 
because somebody generously wrote all this code and then said, you know what, you can use my code for free, and that's fine, I'll be okay with that. You don't even have to credit me or even mention me ever in your life. And you can even talk shit about the code that I gave you and say it's crap. Uh, they, they're very, <laughs> the, I said this before, but the open source community is just absolutely incredible. Um, but somewhere in that code is code that looks like your homework code. They have to do the same things that you did in your homework. It exists in that code that you're importing. Uh, so for three of those pieces of functionality, you have to write open source reports and actually dig into that library and see, like actually see and find the code that actually does the thing that looks like your homework code. So establishing the TCP connections, whatever framework you use, where are the TCP connections being established? Where uh, is that TCP server doing its thing? So where's that boundary between HTTP and TCP? I want to know where it is, or I want to know, I mean, I want to know that you know where it is, that you went through the library and saw how the library works. Where are HTTP headers parsed? And WebSockets, where is the WebSocket handshake occurring? And where are WebSocket frames being parsed? Let me double check my language. Yeah, uh, how frames are being parsed but not how frames are being created. So just notably, there are things that are omitted here. Uh, these are pretty narrowly defined to make sure we're focused on you know, just these few things. I used to say anything that you use, any library you use that you weren't allowed to use on your homework, whatever that thing does for you, you have to write a report on it. And it was just a massive amount of reports that you have to write. So I narrowed these down to these three things. Uh, WebSockets is uh, the handshake and how frames are parsed, but not how frame, frames are sent, uh, generated, and, and then sent. Uh, parsing HTTP headers, but not, uh, but not like uh, buffering, reading content length and buffering, and then reading the body, not parsing multi-part forms. Well, you're not even required to use multi-part forms in your project. Um, but where do you parse the headers specifically? Where is that being done? And where are the TCP connections doing its thing? Uh, established. Where is the connection established? I don't ac actually, based on the wording here, and I always stick to my wording. If I say something that contradicts my documentation, the documentation wins every time. Um, but uh, uh, where the connection is established, not even where the server is being spun up, but where the connections are being established. Where do we get that new TCP connection? which would be like in your code, it would be the receive method being called if you're using Python. Um, no, that's not, that's not right, the handle method. Where the handle method is being called, like where is that happening inside this library that you're using? So those are the three things that we wanna do. And I think I'll leave it up to a vote, right? Of which one of those three, I'll go into a, uh, a flash server and uh, which one of those y'all want to see? A very informal vote. Uh, but let's go through the report itself. So the report, you take this report as a template and then use uh, this as, your, um, as the beginning of your report. So if you filled out this template, that'll be your reports. We also want to know about licensing. What's the license associated with the code that you got? So there's all this open source code out there that you're welcome to use, but each one of them comes with a license. Most of them, that you'll, especially the ones that you'll use in this uh, project, most of the licenses are, you can do whatever the hell you want with this code, but it still will have a license. There has to be a license, because if there's no license, that would mean, if you've heard the term all rights reserved, uh, whenever you produce anything, especially code in the context of what we're talking about now, you own the copyright to that code and nobody else is allowed to use it. You have the right to copy that code. So if somebody copies your code and pastes it in their code, they violated your copyright. And that's automatic, you don't have to file anything, that just is. If uh, I type some characters right now in this document, I own the copyright of those characters and you're not allowed to copy them by US law. Uh, if you have a license, if you attach a license to something that you've authored, then you're loosening that right. You're waiving your copyright, and you're saying, look, I know I have this copyright protection from the government, but I'm going to waive that right and replace it with this license and say, look, you're allowed to copy this code. 
I'm not going to enforce my copyright that I have for this code. I'm going to let everybody use it. And there's different levels of restrictions, different copyrights, uh, different licenses have different restrictions and different uh, amounts of uh, your ability to use that code. For, uh, for example, there's copyleft licenses. So if somebody writes open source code and leaves a, uh, puts a copyleft license on it, that means you're welcome to use it, you can use it and do whatever the hell you want with it, but whatever you produce that evolves from that code or uses that code must also have the same license attached to it. So if you use one of those libraries, your code also has to be open source and has to be copyleft. Uh, there's some uh, licenses that say you can use this for whatever you want as long as it's not commercial purposes. So you can't take that, your, their code and then profit off of it, which is pretty common. Um, and there's other licenses that just say, do whatever the hell you want with this code. I don't even care if you go and make money. I don't care if you just take it and then sell it to somebody else who doesn't know that it's free. Uh, you can do whatever you want with it. So looking at the license for each uh, library that you use, each framework and library, and telling us what you learned about that license, uh, what kind of restrictions it has or lack thereof. And then the magic. So I want to see, and the TAs want to see, what this library does, how, not what it does, how it does what it does. You do have to go into the code of these libraries. I swear every semester I have, like, it seems like five teams do this, where they don't actually go into the libraries. They just copy and paste their lines of code that used the library and say, yeah, I called Flask, you know, new Flask, uh, not even new, not in Python. I just created a server with Flask and then did server.run. That's how TCP works. That's how this library does TCP. Like, does anybody actually think that's what I'm asking of you at a 300 level course? Like, where are the lines of code where you called the methods of the library? Uh, please don't be one of those teams. They're the ones in the empty seats that are gonna end up doing that. But uh, no, that's, that's not what I wanna see from you. What I want is to see actually in the code of the library, how does it do the thing that it does? Uh, and I want specific links to code in GitHub. So let's get on with it and actually see what we're talking about. Did, uh... Yeah, once you get into streaming video, so for what we're doing in, in this class, your apps aren't gonna do too much. I guess if you're building a game, it depends how that game is built, um, but you can build that so all the graphics are rendered client side and your server doesn't have to do too much heavy lifting. But yeah, once you're handling video, I, I'm amazed that the internet can handle HD video. It's actually pretty incredible that like YouTube and Netflix can exist uh, sending HD video to millions of people simultaneously. Uh, that takes a lot of power. Uh, but we're not processing videos. Uh, we're not even sending videos. They process uh, the upload to YouTube, all the videos that it's ingesting and then processing encode, re-encoding, and then storing, uh, and then hosting for everybody is an absolutely incredible amount of computing power. I'm surprised something like that exists at all. It's, uh, it's crazy what computers can do these days. Back in my day, we couldn't do that. Uh, so once we reach the point where it looks like our homework code, we don't have to explain further? Yeah, I'd say, in general, I guess. We don't need to explain the Python standard library suck of stuff. No, no, no. Yeah, so once you get it, yeah, exactly. Once you get into code that you could use that would be legal on your homework, then yeah, you're done. You don't have to explain, okay, this imported Python socket server, uh, this is how socket server does the TCP three-way handshake. No, you don't have to go lower than we did in our homework code. But I wanna bridge the gap, the whole idea, if I can sum it up, the reports in a sentence is, bridging the gap between your homework code and your project code. Because your project code, that's what you're gonna be doing the rest of your career. You're gonna be using these libraries. You're not gonna be doing the homework code stuff anymore. But I want you to be able to take the knowledge from that homework code, what, everything we've done there, and transfer it over here into what's going to be useful for you in the future. That's the goal of reports, is to bridge that gap. Uh, so once you get to homework code looking stuff, you're done. For using Django and Sakurai-O, do I, we need to write separate reports for each? Yeah, well, you need to write the three reports. So your socket report would be about Sakurai-O and your 
uh, header parsing report and your uh, TCP report would be about Django. Uh, but yeah, you would have two different libraries. And that'll be true for pretty much everyone. It's rare to have a web framework that has socket functionality built in just out of the gate, you know, out of the box. You're usually going to be importing Socket.io and your web framework. So you'll have at least two libraries. Pretty much all of you will have two libraries for your reports. If we're using two frameworks like Flask and React, oh, just don't. <laughs> but, but if you are, for instance, uh, anybody who uses React in this class just has more headaches than, than I wanted them to have to deal with. Is doing this report for just one of them fine? Some features end up being in both frameworks. Uh, so React, yeah, React's weird because it has like a front end and a back end component. Uh, so anything front end related, I don't care about at all. You don't have to write any reports for that. So the front end part of React, but React does, like your front end talks to React, which talks to your API. Uh, so if there is a feature that's in both, you know, you gotta implement that. I would say, yeah, like where had HTTP headers parsed, I think that'll be, you know, wherever those are parsed, that's the one you gotta write a report for. For the TCP connection, I mean, you have two TCP servers at that point. I guess I'd be satisfied if you do one of them where one of the TCP servers is initiated. I think I'd be okay with that. And preferably for your API, I think I'd be happier with the API. But yeah, it, it adds more complexity than then you have to go through. But if you like React and you want to build a beautiful front end, knock yourself up. Ain't gonna stop you. Uh, so I have a Flask app, and I want to show a couple techniques of how to better find the code for your reports. Very first one, super useful. I use this all the time for everything. Uh, control or I'm on a Mac, so command and click. So if I want to see what app.run does, because I'm trying to look for my TCP code, and I want to look into this method and figure out what it does, I'm going to hold command, and I'm going to click on it. And that's going to take me to the definition of that method. Uh, this, will, this is a good start, but it's not going to get us really where we want to go, but this is a good start. If we command click on things, it's going to take us into the code. You can see I'm in my virtual environment too, because Everybody needs two virtual environments. I'm inside Python, and I have Flask installed uh, through pip. So I have Flask installed here, and I have all the source code for Flask right here. I can see all of the beautiful code that has been provided for me. And I'm in the uh, app.py uh, code in Flask. Uh, so that's where it took me. Actually, Flask isn't all that much code. I mean, maybe some of these files are huge. This is gonna break 2,000 lines, 2,500 lines, but still, I mean, it's smaller than I thought it would be. Uh, and I can find the run method here. Out of here. No, oh, let me get, let me get back to it. Uh, and run is going to take, you know, the host, the port, uh, debug, true or not. Actually, it's none by default. Uh, an optional, I don't even know what that is, but some optional thing that I never use, and then returns none. And if I scroll past all the documentation, I can get to the actual code for the method of what it's going to be doing. And library code like this, professional grade code, is usually pretty unreadable, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Uh, it, it takes a lot of practice, I should say. Uh, that said, what's on screen right now isn't too bad. Um, but this is going to be the actual code that ha is executed when we run the thing. So we load a dot environment, uh, checking if it's in debug mode, getting the server name. I forgot you could use the syntax in Python. If server name, let's read some more code out of this. So if, uh, this is why, I was wondering why the defaults were none. I, it's, I don't look into this code often enough. Um, but the host by default is none, so if you don't provide a host, then this is going to be true. And it's going to check 
some variable, wherever this came from, uh, and set it to that. Else, by default, you're going to get your local host. So if you just say app.run, and you're like, I've never had to specify a host or port. Well, here's exactly why you're going to get localhost as your default, and your default port, 5,000. So if you don't specify a port, you get 5,000 as your port. Uh, some more setup. And then we get to uh, an import. I always hate seeing imports in the middle of code. I'm sure there's a good reason to do it, uh, that they want to be more optimal, I guess, to not import this if they don't need it. But this line, you're going to probably learn to hate that line. Uh, so the Flask library and most Python libraries, one of the things that you're going to find when you go through these if you're using Python, whether it's Flask or Django or uh, Tornado or whatever else, is that they're built on this uh, library that I keep saying and someday I'm going to learn how to pronounce this properly and then I never do and then sometimes I do and then I forget. Um, Workzug? Workzug? They all use this library. And then this library, in turn, uses the Python libraries. So if you're seeing this in your search when you're looking at these reports, you're on the right track, assuming you're using Python. You're on the right track if you're using this, seeing this work zug. So from this uh, library, we're going to import run simple. So we're going to get a simple server. There's a bunch of different types of servers that this work zug can run. And then we're going to run. A simple server, lots of configuration, and we can start looking for when this is starting our TCP socket. Uh, static files, use a debugger, da, da, da. make server, sounds like it's a little promising. Use reloader, a lot of configuration, server.serve forever, ooh, that sounds good. Serve forever, and we're, we're in the work zug library now. Uh, once we click Run Simple, we jumped over to that library. So we're not even in Flask anymore. Flask doesn't do the heavy lifting itself. It uses another library for uh, the actual heavy lifting, which is this library. And this library, as I mentioned, in turn uses Python itself. So we're in this serve forever. Uh, let's try jumping into this one. So socket server. Did we actually get into... Oh, shit, we actually got there. There forever, let me back up one. So serving in the work zug. Usually this goes a lot worse in lecture because everything has to go worse in lecture. Uh, so we got this serve forever method. And that's actually calling our super classes serve uh, uh, method of serve forever, which is actually getting into the Python socket server. So whatever our super class is, so let's look at what our class is that we're currently in. Base WSGI server extends HTTP server, and HTTP server is part of Python. So we're in an HTTP server, which extends a TCP server, which is in the socket server library, which is getting into the code that we're used to. Uh, and we are calling the serve forever method of the TCP server, or, which is probably a method in the base server class. Uh, but we're in our Python code. We went from our code to Flask to WorkZug to Python, and we finally got to the socket server class where this is being used. So we're in code that looks like homework code. We got to code that's using the socket server class. So we're feeling good about that. So serving was the last one that that was really um, really needed for this. What's the, what's the quickest way to do this? So what I want to see in the report is that whole chain. How did we get from your code to homework code? And I want to see links to your GitHub. Oh, thank goodness that worked. I didn't want to go down that journey. Uh, and I want to see all that, the links to that code. So you have to find that code in GitHub. You're using open source libraries for your project. The source is out there. I want to see links to the actual source. And notice that this file is a billion lines long. Well, 1,100. So I want a link to the actual code that's relevant to your project, which I forgot what it was. How did we get here? Run simple. 
So like you would say, uh, we got into Flask, and then Flask called run simple, and we got into WorkZug's run simple method. I want a link to that actual thing, that actual method, make server, where am I? What you can do on GitHub, you go to the line number, click on this, click your ellipses here, and copy the permalink. That's gonna give you a link which goes directly to that line. Do not paste us a link to an 1100 line file and say, oh, it's in here. Because I don't know that you actually let look through that file and could tell what was going on with that. Uh, it just shows that you, you know, did something, um, but doesn't really show me that you know what's going on in that code and how to find what you're looking for. Uh, so I didn't get time, I didn't do the rest of this, but uh, running the debugger really helps here. So when you're looking for your HTTP header specifically, if you set a debug point, uh, a breakpoint at one of your paths, for example, run the debugger and then hit that path, let your debugger stop everything and then see the entire stack trace, all the frames that are on the stack at that point, and you're gonna be able to trace through the library code to figure out where, how you got to your actual code being executed. Because when you're control clicking, that works surprisingly well today, uh, that we actually got to the code we were looking for, but when you're control clicking, what'll happen a lot of times is you're gonna run into an interface. You're gonna get to an interface that's actually implemented by the code that's doing the stuff, and you just hit a dead end when you hit the interface because the code is coded to the interface, not the concrete classes, but you need the concrete classes. So when you get to a situation like that, setting a breakpoint and then looking at what the debugger is telling you can help ex extremely uh, when you're doing this. I don't know if I can do this quick enough. We only got like a minute here. Of course, it just exited. Just already in use. Oh, damn it. We almost got there too. Hit the wrong button. Okay, and then we hit the debugger. Hey, we did get there. And then we have the full stack trace of how we got to our method. We can look through all these libraries. We see down here we're in socket server at some point. We're in serving, that's gotta be in work zug. Uh, we can see the whole stack trace of how we got from point from our server running to.